Thank you for staying tuned. It is time for our discussion tonight, which is Ruto's impeachment. We are having Mr. Edwin Kegoli, who is a political analyst, join us via Zoom. Thank you so much, Mr. Kegoli, for making time. Thank you so much, Irene, and I thank God for the opportunity of being with you here today. All right, let's start off from what is happening currently. Amani National Congress Party leader Musale Mudavadi and his party members are now saying they will present a motion in the National Assembly to impeach Deputy President William Ruto. Is their call warranted or are they seeking relevance as a party? First of all, you would want to understand if this is a position that has been adopted officially by the ANC party and you've not seen that procedural process being brought to the public domain. But however, it is everybody else's constitutional right under Article 150 to, you know, impeach, like move a, a motion to impeach the deputy president. And there are grounds that have been spelled, you know, of, of that could warrant an impeachment of the deputy president. But then again, I, we do not know yet because NC has not officially made the move, so we don't know on which grounds they want to remove the deputy president. But until that is done, we just speculate on maybe what they want to do. But then again, uh, when you look at this issue very critically, uh, of course, impeaching the deputy president is not just something you can wake up and do. You see, it, it almost looks like ANC just um, did a knee-jerk reaction, or, or it, the move is a bit impulsive mm -hmm. rather than well thought out process, because you need the numbers in the National Assembly, you need the super majority in the Senate to ratify the decision. When you look at the primary numbers of ANC, you would wonder even if that motion will stay past 20 minutes in the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's just uh, something to seek relevance and uh, <clears throat> And, and maybe to get airtime on, but I do not see any weight in that process. There is no weight, there is no seriousness. They, they don't want to do that. All right, now Jubilee Party, the Kilaweke faction, and ODM party have been complaining about Deputy President William Bruto. Of course, you have heard concerning the issue of Hustler dynasty movement, and therefore it will be appropriate for them or convenient for them to impeach um, Deputy President William Bruto, but According to um, Jubilee Secretary General Rafael Tuju, they will not support the motion as yet. According to ODM, they will convene a parliamentary group meeting come next week to decide on the same. Now, them distancing themselves from the impeachment motion by ANC party, is it because they are afraid the plot will die or we have too much at stake for them to even concentrate on Deputy President William Ruto? What are you reading from that? Too much at stake. And, and, and Jubilee do not want to get into this unnecessary war. You know, even if you are strong, you must choose your battles wisely. Mm -hmm. And impeaching the deputy president is not the best thing to do right now. You see, many Kenyans are emotional people. So if you want to impeach the deputy president, it will only serve to embolden him, to strengthen him. Look at the time between now and when we are supposed to hold general elections. That's a very short span of time and then you ask yourself is it politically making sense to impeach the second in command in this country and i would in my opinion i do not think it's making any sense mm -hmm. and jubilee party distancing itself that means it's not interested in dealing with the deputy president in such a manner mm -hmm. because you see impeaching william ruto as the deputy president mm -hmm. would plant this country into like an imaginable politics which would mean like difficulty in President Kenyatta being able to handle his like remaining term peacefully and like peacefully I mean being able to meet his his uh, development agenda. So mm -hmm. because we are going to see a lot of politics if such a move is sustained both in the National Assembly and the Senate. Mm -hmm. So from the word go, even ODM no, like that is like you don't do that. That's mm -hmm. a no-go zone. Mm -hmm. There's no point, it's not going to add any value, is because like on what grounds do you want to, to impeach the deputy president? You know, you, you must come up with very solid and like the like grounds that can be that can stand trial, not mm -hmm. just something like petty imagination that he's is say he's been hard saying this, he's been hard saying that. And again, we must not forget that we are still in Kenya, mm -hmm. that you know, 
you can you can say anything and you get away with it. Of course, pundits would say that he's he's been clearly uh, insubordinating the president, and <laughs> that's very apparent. Mm -hmm. But then again, uh, is that a, an impeachable offense? You know, some yeah. you can say I have a right to opinion mm -hmm. because somebody like everybody has a right to opinion. They can share their minds and thoughts. So, and there is nothing wrong with that. And there is no law that mandates the deputy president to always agree with the president. Right. So it, it, it also brings this issue of legalese, you know, the, the legal grounds and threshold that would, would, would um, like enable the impeachment of the deputy president. And I, I, at this point, I do not think there is any ground that would constitute such, such a move successfully. All right. Now, according to the motion by, which of, of course has not been presented in, in the National Assembly, a Lugari member of parliament who is the deputy party leader in ANC party says that he has 16 accounts of what he is presenting against the deputy president William Bruto. It requires that at least six. We'll see whether um, the, the motion will sell through. If at all, it will be presented in the National Assembly. But uh, pundits have been questioning why now. We have seen uh, the deputy president William Bruto being defiant since 2018 after the March handshake. Why would you think that they would want to uh, push for it at this particular moment? I think maybe because they lack anything else or meaningful to do. Because why would you want to impeach the deputy president? What, like, is he causing government to stop? <coughs> of course not. Like, the president, Uhuru Kenyatta, who has the constitutional mandate and the authority of this country. Mm -hmm. President Uhuru Kenyatta is not incapacitated. He's mm -hmm. fully mandated and of course, democratically elected. So his deputy, whether they are in consonance or in disagreement, it does not hamper development. If president wants to negotiate facilities that would like spy economic growth and development, he can do that whether or not the deputy president is in government. So it is an ill-advised move for ANC party, and I think they should also be very consistent. Mm -hmm. Because when they talk about economic recovery, like economic policies that would help move this country forward and like lift us from this uh, recession like that we've been plunged in by COVID-19. Mm -hmm. How is impeaching deputy president going to help in that cause? So that means whatever they say, they actually don't believe in it. Mm -hmm. Because right now they should be moving policies and pieces of legislation in the National Assembly and the Senate that would help this country's economy recover. Mm -hmm. But you see what diversionaries they are getting into in something that is ill-advised, some, something that even a serious democracy would like think twice before they do. Because like, of what essence, of what economic sense, of what political sense will it make when you impeach the deputy president? He's not delaying government projects. He's not a signatory of any account. We have the president who is very functional. So they should concentrate on things that matter. Let us focus on BBI. Let us pass it. Let us deal with issues like now that the courts are stopping this process at the county level. What do we need to do? Like, what situation are we in as a country? How do we move the country forward? In fact, they should also be thinking about uh, Mudavadi becoming president because we've heard them say Mudavadi is going to be the president. So instead of wasting time introducing motions that do not make sense to them, that will not even add value, they should go consolidate a voting base so that they will, they, like, they convince Kenyans that they have the best policies. But if this is part of what these guys are, then they have got no agenda for this country. All right, I'm sure Mr. Kegoli have seen. Um, Waipa leader Kalonzo Musioka and C leader Musale Mudavadi and Ford Kenya party leader Musa Zetangula put themselves in a sort of an alliance, a purported alliance, of course trying to scuttle the match that Deputy President William Bruto, the inroads that the Deputy President William Bruto has made so far, the concern being the by-elections that we are having. Um, NC party is anticipating to win in Matungu, Deputy President William Bruto, UDA, um, sort of... Um, Allegiance has put a candidate in Matungu, uh, Wetangula, he's, he's eyeing Kabuchai, and Waipa Party leader Kalonzo Musiaka is eyeing Machako senatorial seat. Now, when you look at this purported alliance, do you think it is strong enough to bow out Deputy President William Bruto influence in some of these political areas or in some of these constituencies? One 
thing is they have to gang up in order to maybe just try to look like they have some weight and some strength. And William Ruto is almost like a lone soldier. You know, <laughs> I, I think, I think um, it's going to be very interesting. And uh, first of all, it, it, when you allow me a little latitude, mm -hmm. like the alliance between Mudavadi and Wetangwe mm -hmm. in Western Kenya, and of course, noting the influence of deputy, President William Ruto in the in the in the, in the, in the mm. region, mm -hmm. you will realize that William Ruto controls some section of Western Kenya, not entirely, but so. some significant section of Western Kenya, which mm -hmm. of course is making a lot of political sense. Mm -hmm. And then again, in these uh, three by elections, we are going to see really how Deputy President is well rooted in Western Kenya and what influence he can make in. Um, of course, uh, the by-election in the Kalonzo backyard. And uh, of course, Kalonzo has to think about deputy president. He has to think about uh, Governor Alfred Mutua. And you see, Kalonzo is now facing a lot of battles because there is this youthful Governor uh, Mutua who is coming and wants to lay claim to the, the eastern region that Kalonzo has controlled for a long time. You see, there comes a time when um, you s there is vibrance and new blood and freshness and new energy that comes and challenges the dominance of somebody and they can easily like take over and, 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 and of course render the traditional leader like, irrelevant. But then again, that is an issue of time. We will see how the people will decide on the ballot. However, it should not be underestimated the influence and power of Dr. William Ruto in the said by-elections because we can easily tilt that the result because mm -hmm. uh, he's a very sharp and astute politician and he goes for what he believes in. Look at what happened in um, Zambwini. You would never believe such a thing would happen. Like That is the stronghold of ODM. So it wouldn't come as a surprise if Deputy President William Ruto's candidates win, especially in Western Kenya, because mm -hmm. he's really pitched tent in Western Kenya. And, and you know, Western Kenya people are largely seen as very liberal, like they listen to everybody who comes to talk to them. But again, Mudavadi and Weta need to do their homework. Let them consolidate their base, and then they get a clear leader. We know it is Mudavadi, Weta should back Mudavadi and allow him to take the lead. But otherwise, it is just uh, like the ordinary thing we know. All right. Now, when you look at Ruto's body language, he seems to be a man who is unhappy with Jubilee leadership, even though he is in government. And therefore, some have said that maybe it is time for him to resign, given that when you look into the Jubilee leadership and the way um, the Jubilee government is going in terms of debt and the economic situation, it seems like a government which is sinking, according to economic experts, and therefore him resigning might salvage his character as he is heading for the 2022 presidential candidate. Do you hold the same opinion or perception of, of what is happening right now? I do not foresee a chance of Deputy Pres President William Ruto resigning because he has clearly stated that uh, he's been handed a mandate by Kenyans alongside President Uhuru Kenyatta as his principal assistant. And then, of course, uh, it's very clear, not just in Kenya, but across the world, economies have taken a very bad hit. And you see, what countries are doing right now is to create that economic recovery, growth, and development so that jobs lost can be recovered and we can create more jobs that would like accommodate the high number of young people who have been rendered jobless. And um, moving forward, I think economy is a priority. And, and, and that's why we even have this BBI process. So, and the, like, of course, you've had uh, Deputy President William Ruto criticizing some government projects and saying that they have not performed because of, uh, of course, the coming in of uh, Raila Odinga. But then again, we ask yourself, what did Raila do to stop mm -hmm. the implementation of this project? Yes. See, Raila had came in to create a, like a situation of coherency, a situation of togetherness, like bringing Kenyans together. Because if like President Uhuru Kenyatta did not agree to the handshake, then I don't know what Kenya would be talking about right now. Because mm -hmm. you look at how things were quickly turning into or spiraling into mm -hmm. at that particular time, immediately post-2017. You would really worry as a Kenyan that will we hold together 
as the preamble of our Kenyan constitution says, mm -hmm. that are we going to realize uh, like, like progress, development from these situations? You look at the way things were happening and it would really worry a lot of people. Like investors had gone away and those even who are considering to come to Kenya were not coming. The economy was doing badly. The people were doing, like people were dying and, and we were really on rocks. So it took President Kenyatta that selfless act to say, let me come together with the opposition leader so that we can create harmony in this country. So anybody who castigates or criticizes this process, and then I do not know what type of Kenya they want for this country. Because what we need as a country is to, to be harmonious so that it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter my tribe, but what matters is my ability to deliver. And that when you get something, it is purely on merit rather than where you come from. So I think Deputy President started his campaigns way too early, in fact, even before 2017. Mm -hmm. So he, since they were elected in 2013, he's been like preparing to be president. Mm -hmm. So it has come at a time when he feels like now this is my time. And, and Irene, as you had mentioned earlier, that in, like after 2017 general election, we saw him now, of course, becoming bolder and being targeted at 2022 mm -hmm. and after the handshake he even became even more bolder and even more targeted and even more uh, resolute about 2022 because perhaps he feels that if i do not work this on my own mm -hmm. then i would trust somebody that they'll give me the mandate and then they don't give me the mandate because again this is politics so and then uh, he has just maybe suffered that you know like he displayed his, his energy way before time. The leaps were just way too soon. Mm -hmm. Because again, we are in February right now, and we are talking about 2022 elections in August. Mm -hmm. So it's a way, way long from now. And then again, it is up to Kenya to decide which way to go. All right, now let's focus to the parliamentary group meeting that each and every party is holding ahead of parliament resuming after a long recess. We have seen Deputy President William Ruto today have a meeting with the Tanga Tanga faction of Jubilee Party. President Turi Kenyatta is tomorrow expected to have a parliamentary group meeting with Jubilee members of parliament, in members of parliament, that is senators and um, the legislators. Now, the question, this is the third time the Deputy President is holding a meeting with the Tanga Tanga allies ahead of parliament resuming business. Do you think he is trying to galvanize his numbers because he, seems, he sees the turbulence that President Ruru Kenyatta and ODM leader Raila Odinga will create in Parliament ahead of the referendum bill. Yeah, y your question is very right, Irene. And uh, in any case, somebody will always need reassurance that we are still in business. And of course, him holding the parliamentary group or hosting MPs allied to him is um, serving as a reassurance that these members of parliament are still with him and his soldiers are well intact and well positioned for any uh, legislative battle that might come on the floor of the house. But then again, um, <coughs> of course, party, of course, uh, party leaderships will want to whip their members in a particular direction. And Irene, you've seen a number of uh, nominated M uh, MPs in, in, in Jubilee. Uh, being shown the door, like, of course, the, the, the nominations being revoked. So this is a deliberate and, and bold move by Jubilee Party saying that, hey, we are ready and willing to discipline you as long as you continue to be errant, because the, 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 the Secretary, Secretary General, uh, Rafael Tuju, said that we've been tolerating these members for a long time, and it is time that we deal with them and we make sure that they tore the party line and ensure discipline. So, um, of course, you must always prepare for anything, and that's why, uh, of course, the deputy president held a meeting with, with the, the members allied to him. But then again, the question is, how many numbers will they be able to marshal in the National Assembly and Senate mm -hmm. to pass the agenda? And Irene, today, the members were highlighting the, some of the initiatives they want to undertake in the National Assembly. And the question I would want to ask is that where have they been? Because they want to revisit bills that were passed somewhere in 2013 for all that long. Why is it that they are realizing these bills are making economic sense right now? Is it that they want to hoodwink the public and look like they are 
advocating for the public, yet they are not. Because what we need right now is policies and pieces of legislation that will create wealth, that will create employment for our young people, for our women. We want to know how we are going to manage our public debt. We want to know how is it that the country can capitalize on the innovation and entrepreneurial spirit of its young people, you know. So they need to be serious and they need to be uh, sincere with Kenyans. But what, what they came out to discuss today looks like and even sounds very insincere. Where have they been? You cannot come late into the day and you say, now let us try and advocate for issues that benefit the common one entity. Where have you been? Mm -hmm. They've been having all this chance and space in the National Assembly to do this, but they didn't do. Look at some of the bills they passed, the bills that came to hurt the people. You see, we are even taxed more right now because some of these MPs are not serious with their work. Mm -hmm. They would let pieces of legislation sail through National Assembly without seriously deliberating on these pieces of legislation mm -hmm. to make sure that they cushion the Mwananchi. And now, BBI is bringing a process that would ensure that young people, once you're graduating, you're looking at something. Right now, Irene, you would not be guaranteed of anything when you're graduating because how, where will you get like a collateral to get to secure a loan? You know, like there are those who are coming from very humble backgrounds. It is practically hard for them to make it in life because the chance is not fair. So what BBI is saying about young people, which this, some of these Tangatanga -tanga people do not want to tell the public, mm -hmm. is that in those innovation hubs in every world, every young person will have a fair chance in life. It, it will come down to what can you do as a person? Not necessarily how much money you have, but can you develop an idea and then you'll be trained and of course <coughs> conducted through the process and then facilitated. So it's about, it's, it's now coming back to us. Can we innovate as you know, research is pointing that we are among the best uh, in, in innovation and creativity? All right, now, finally, the heart of the discussion that uh, they were having today at Karen um, has been the issue of the referendum law. We're having the Justice and Legal Affairs Committee having a referendum law that gives a yes or no vote when it comes to the referendum. We're having the other one by Constitutional Implement Oversight Implementation Committee, which wants a multiple vote when it comes to the referendum. And now Deputy President William Bruto Allies wants a multiple, multiple vote when it comes to the referendum. But ODM leader Ryan Laudinga and President Uru Kenyatta is opposed to the same. Now, when the referendum law is brought into the House, how do you think the Deputy President will be able to marshal numbers to ensure that they get their way on this issue of a yes, no, or a multiple vote when it comes to um, voting for the referendum? I, I mean, I, they are chasing shadows. These people are chasing shadows. Like, the, this process is already before county assemblies, and they should they should be understanding the law much way better. Like, at this point, what else can we do? Imagine, Irene, we are going into a referendum of multiple choice, like multiple questions. So they are asking about ombudsman. What are you saying? Do you like the ombudsman or not? So you pick yes or no. Can you imagine, Irene, the volumes of papers that the IBC will have, number one, to print, number two, give you as a person to vote on. So we are looking at, I don't know how many questions, how many volumes of bundles of papers, how long will it take to count, how long will it take to verify, how long will it take to, to, to announce the final results. What these people are proposing is a complete impracticality. If it was electronic, it would way be better. But as, as long as this process is manual, so what they want to do is to cut to cut trees because of course we need more paper. They want us to to, to, to to hurt our environment, and like I don't know what they want us to do because this process is tedious. You want to imagine Irene down in the village, that old mama who wants to take part in this process because she feels her grandson and her granddaughter they need a fair shot in life. So she wants to make a decision on this BBA process. But now because of the volume and bundles of papers as a result of multiple questions, will make her tire out. And by the time she's even getting halfway, 
she's, she's actually not able to continue. Mm. So the target she had is already defeated. But you see, when we get to a question where it is, do you like BBI? <laughs> yes, I do. Do you like BBI? No, I don't. So you just put your yes or no. That is easier, that is quicker, and anybody can make a decision. Yes, I do not agree with everything that is in the BBI, but the majority of the provisions in the BBI make a lot of economic sense, a lot of political and administrative sense. So I want to vote yes. And then whatever remains and whatever is an issue or a gray area, this matters will get their life through the pieces of legislation that will be sailing through the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. And Irene, see, the BBI in itself is not an end, but rather a means. So in every provision, there is the route to take these processes through the National Assembly. And elected members of parliament will have a chance to fine tune and put every single detail that is needed. You see, everything cannot be contained in the primary document or the constitution. That's why we have acts. That's why we have bills going through the National Assembly. And people should not get worried that once BBI is passed and our issue is not captured, that's the end of the road. We have members of parliament, and these issues are going to be very well articulated through the pieces of legislation that will give life to BBI. And that's why, Irene, you saw, like, when you go to, to the constitution that we have right now, there is like a number of bills that the constitution spells out like a time frame within which they had to be enacted so that the constitution is given uh, a life and and it's fully implemented because we cannot capture every single detail in it but now that's why we come to the national assembly so let these people hold their peace let them interrogate the bbi rationally and not castigate this document without getting their facts straight they have representation in the national assembly and they should rely on their MPs to make sure that they incorporate every sort of provision that they think is important and cardinal to this BBI process. We have not locked out anybody, and everybody is still allowed. Because even when um, Irene committees go into sittings in the National Assembly, there is that public participation uh, uh, chance. Right. So anybody from the public can apply to give submissions to a bill concerning this BBI. So it is not an end in itself, but right. a means. This is just like like that stepping stone, that primary document that mm -hmm. will house the essentials and then everything else, the body, will come through the legislation process. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Edwin Kigoli, for making time. That is quite a perspective concerning the issue of BBI and the referendum bill that is being tabled in the Parliament very, very soon. We're taking a short break. We'll be back with more on what is happening in the country and beyond our borders. See you in a moment.